Abraham has a son of the promise named Isaac. Isaac has a son of the promise named Jacob. Jacob has 12 sons and one daughter named Dinah. The next to the youngest son, Joseph, is sold as a prisoner into Egypt. Eventually, the whole family comes down because they need food during a famine. And they are in Egypt for 430 years, at which time Moses rises up, leads the children of Israel out of Egypt across the Red Sea into the desert. They wander for 40 years. There's the rebellion of Korah. There are the four common sins that 1 Corinthians mentions. Then finally Moses dies. Joshua, the heir apparent, leads the children of Israel from the plains of Moab off uh, across into Israel. Uh, they walk around the city of Jericho, the walls fall down, and they begin the reconquest of the land that had originally been given to Abraham, Isaac, and Jacob. The reconquest is led by first by Joshua and Caleb, but then eventually by judges, women like Deborah, men like Samson, men like Gideon. The last of the judges was Samuel. Samuel, of course, anoints Saul as the first king. Saul starts off well, ends poorly. He is succeeded by David. David is the, the, the great king. He becomes the kind of the, the, the golden one of Israel. And then his son Solomon continues his reign, also does well. Then Solomon's son Rehoboam turns out to be a bit of a jerk. The kingdom divides and the ten tribes of the north separate from the two tribes of the south. Now the kings of the north figured they couldn't have their people going back down south to Jerusalem to worship there at the temple that Solomon had built. So instead they made up their own religion. Well, isn't that convenient? Who wants to be a priest? Okay, you, 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 a little oil on their forehead. Okay, a little mumbo jumbo, you're now a priest. Oh, but what are we gonna do for gods? Well, remembering what Aaron had done way back in the desert, they make two golden calves. Yeah, the same old, same old. Two golden calves, and these now, they hold up and say, Israel, these are your gods. If that weren't bad enough, one of the kings of the north, whose name was Ahab actually married a foreign princess. She was a princess from a place called Sidon. So she's a Sidonian princess. And this princess brings into Israel the worship of Baal. Yeah, Baal as in Beelzebub. Baal is Satan. So she brings Satan worship into Israel, the, the ten tribes of the north that we call Israel. Not only that, she brings 450 of her prophets there. These are the prophets of Baal. This woman's name was Jezebel. Yeah, even the name itself sounds evil, doesn't it? She was a backstabbing woman. She was a conniving woman. She was a master of palace intrigue. Like, let me give you an example. One thing what Jezebel did. Uh, King Ahab, her husband, has noticed that there's a beautiful plot of ground right next to his palace. It is a, a vineyard and he thinks, hmm, this would be a great place to grow my vegetables. So he, he inquires as to uh, who is the owner of the property. He learns it's a man named Naboth. So he goes to Naboth and he says, Naboth, my friend, I notice you have a lovely vineyard right next to my palace. I would like to buy that from you. Name your price. How much will it cost? Naboth says, oh, I'm sorry, king. I can't sell it to you. It's part of my inheritance. And the king says, no, 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 money is of no object. Just tell me what you want for it. Naboth says, no, king, I'm not going to sell it. It's part of my inheritance. Well, this throws King Ahab into a depression. He goes back to the palace. He lies down on his bed. He turns his face toward the wall and he refuses to eat. This is depression because he couldn't get the vineyard to make his vegetable garden. So Jezebel comes in and says, well, what's wrong? What's wrong, honey? <laughs> and he says, well, you know, that plot of land I wanted, well, Naboth won't sell it to me. And she says, he won't sell it to you, the king? 
what don't you understand about being king? Here, I'll show you how it's done. So she gets a piece of the royal stationery and she writes a, a letter in Ahab's name. And she says, um, she writes it to the elders of Naboth's town. So, dear elders of Naboth's town, I want you to organize a big feast. I want you to put Naboth in the place of honor, and then I want you to put a couple scoundrels across the table from him, and I want them to bring false accusations against him so that he is stoned to death. Sincerely, Jezebel. Oh no, she doesn't sign it her name, does she? Sincerely, King Ahab. Puts it in the envelope, sends it to the elders of Naboth's village. Well, they get it. What else are we going to do? The king has told us to do that. So they have a big feast. They put Naboth in the place of honor. They get two scoundrels to sit across from him at some point where they stand up in the feast and say, I can't believe what he just said. Can you believe what he just said? No, that's incredible. He just cursed the king and God. I know. Can you imagine he cursing the king and God right here in the festival? Let's kill him. So they take up stones. They go outside the town and they throw stones and the, the town people kill Naboth. The elders send a note back to King Ahab, dear King Ahab have the dirty deed is done. Jezebel takes it into Ahab and she says, there, that's how a king gets something that he wants. So you see what kind of woman she was. I mean, what's gone wrong? These are the chosen people of Israel, right? These are the offspring of Abraham, Isaac, and Jacob. These are ten of the patriarchs' families up in the north. They're worshiping the devil, and they're led by this Sidonian princess, murderous. But God has not left his people without a witness. There is a prophet named Elijah. Elijah goes to the palace, knocks on the door. King Ahab in? Yeah, King Ahab, just to get your attention, it's not going to rain until I come back. He goes away. A month passes, no rain. Six months pass, no rain. A year passes, no rain. Now the people are hungry. The crops have failed. Two years pass without any rain. Three years pass without any rain. People are starving. And now Elijah comes back. Knock, knock, knock. Ahab, now that I have your attention, here's what I'd like you to do for me. Elijah says, I would like you to call all of Israel together at Mount Carmel. You pick the day. So King Ahab picks a day and he sends out messengers. Everybody, you got to come together at Mount Carmel. We're going to have a big gathering. So all the people come to together at the appointed time on Mount Carmel. They gather there. There's Elijah. And here are the 450 prophets of Baal also there. Elijah says to the people, People, how long are you going to waver between these two gods? Between the true God and Baal? The people were quiet. They didn't say anything. Elijah says, all right then. Here's how we're going to do it. We're going to have a contest today. We're going to prove once and for all which is the true God. And the people are like, yeah, that's a good idea. Contest. Elijah says, here's how we're going to do it. We're actually going to have a barbecue contest. Mm, barbecue, that sounds good. It sounds like meat to the people. Yeah. Elijah says, here are the rules. The prophets of Baal get a bull. I get a bull. This will be the sacrifice. The prophets of Baal get wood for the fire. I get wood for the fire. But neither one of us will get matches. And the one true God is the one who sends fire from the sky and lights his prophets offering. And everybody's like, yeah, great idea. Elijah says to the prophets of Baal, okay, there are 450 of you. You guys go ahead. So the 450 prophets of Baal arrange their wood and they kill the bull and put the meat on it. And then they're like, hmm, fire dance, eh? Hmm. Anybody know a fire dance? And they start dancing around. It's hi, 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 And they're dancing and but there's no fire from the sky. 
They start in the morning, they go till late morning, they're still, now they're working themselves up into a frenzy, and they're making up stuff. And as was their custom, they get out their knives and they start to cut themselves. This was part of the way they impressed everybody. And they would cut themselves. So now there's dust in the air, 450 men tramping around, dancing, and now blood squirting everywhere. And Elijah is not one to suffer fools lightly, so he's over there making fun of them. He's, hey, maybe you need to chant louder. Maybe your God's on vacation. Or maybe your God is in the bathroom. Chant louder. Do something else. Get his attention. And of course, this just infuriates them, makes them, makes them more angry. Well, about noon, finally they quit because there is no fire from the sky. They throw in the towel and they look over at Elijah and they say, all right, we didn't get any fire. Let's see you, wise guy. It's your idea. Elijah looks around, he finds a big stone, he brings it over, he sets it down, and he says, Reuben, lays it down. Next big stone. Simeon, next big stone. Levi, next big stone. Judah, yeah, right down the line to Benjamin. All 12 tribes of Israel. He builds an altar out of 12 stones, and they know what he's talking about. Then he puts the wood on it. Then he kills his bull and he arranges the meat. Now, you know a bull, that's a lot of, I mean, that's a lot of animal. It's going to be a pretty big pile out here. Then he gets a shovel and he digs a trench around the perimeter of this altar he has made. Then he sees four jars. Now, remember, there's been a famine for, th uh, a drought for three years. So he sees these four jars and he says, fill them up with water, bring them over. So they bring over the four jars and he dumps them on top of the whole pile. And then he says, fill them up again. They bring them over and he dumps them on top. That's eight. He's fill them up again, brings them over, dumps them on again. That's 12. Again, he's trying to make a point. 12 jars of water. The other point he's trying to make is nobody is going to accuse him of having some trickery or some kind of spontaneous combustion or something. He wants this to be definitive once and for all proof. He wants the people to reject the worship of Baal. Now it's already, it's afternoon. He looks up to the sky. Then he looks at the people and he says, People, come on in closer. And they move in. Closer still. And they move in. Now they're all kind of right around the altar. Then he prays. Dear God, Father of Abraham, Isaac, and Jacob, Show yourself today. Show yourself today so these people will know that you have chosen me. Show yourself today to turn their hearts back to you. To turn their hearts back to... Here it comes. Fire from the sky. It flashes down from the sky. And not just a little bit of fire. This is like lightning. The meat is consumed. It's not rare. It's not medium rare. It's not well done. It's, it's ashes. Not just the meat. The wood is consumed. It's gone. Not just the meat and the wood. The stones themselves are consumed by this fire from the sky. And the water that had filled that little trench around the perimeter is lapped up by this fire. The people having seen this right in front of their very own eyes, fall as one person to the ground with their forehead to the ground and they chant, Oh, the Lord, He is God. The Lord, He is God. The Lord, He is God. And then they look over at the 450 prophets of Baal who have gotten suddenly quite nervous. And Elijah says, they were leading you to death, and now they must die. So they take them down in the valley, and they kill all 450 of them. Now, King Ahab is watching all this. Jezebel hasn't come, but King Ahab has. King Ahab has seen all of this, but he's not killed. And Elijah says to him, 
King, uh, why don't you get a bite to eat? Hope you brought a picnic. And then you're going to need to head home because it's going to rain. Now remember, it hasn't rained for three years. Now Elijah turns and he takes his servant and he goes up even higher up Mount Carmel. He gets up to where they can see out over the Mediterranean Sea. And then he gets down on his knees and he prays for rain. Then he tells his servant, go look, see if there are clouds forming over the Mediterranean Sea. The servant goes and looks and he comes back and he says, no, no clouds. Elijah prays again. Now go look. The servant goes and looks, comes back, no boss, no clouds. Elijah prays again for the third time. Now go look. He goes out and he looks, no boss, I'm telling you, telling you, there are no clouds there. It's clear blue sky. He prays the fourth time. Now go look. He goes and looks, no, he comes back. Praise the fifth time. Go look. He goes and looks. No, comes back. Praise the sixth time. Now go look. He goes and looks. No, he comes back. No, boss, I'm telling you, there's nothing there. Elijah prays the seventh time. Now go look. He goes and looks. And, hmm. Well, that's funny. He comes back. He says, um, boss, I don't know if it means anything or not, but there is one little cloud. It's a, about the size of the palm of a man's hand. Elijah stands up. That's enough, he says. That's big enough. He goes back down where, to where King Ahab is and he says, Hey, you better get out of here. The rain's coming. And now they can see it. Storm clouds are forming behind them. King Ahab jumps in his chariot, starts for home. Elijah is overtaken by the Spirit of God. He lifts up his robes, he tucks it in his belt, and he takes off running. In fact, he runs so fast, he passes the king on the way to the palace. And you would think that this contest would have settled it once and for all. But it has not. King Ahab gets home that night, and guess who is waiting for him? Arms crossed, toe a tapping. Jezebel says, and where have you been all day? And King Ahab kind of sheepishly says, well, you know, a funny thing happened today. Um, do you remember those 450 prophets of Baal you had? <laughs> I don't know how to tell you this. Uh, they're kind of all dead. Jezebel is furious. This contest has meant nothing to her. She calls again for the royal stationery, and now she writes a letter to Elijah. Dear Elijah, today there are 450 dead prophets. By this time tomorrow, there will be 451 dead prophets, if you get my meaning. XO, 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 Jezebel, and sends it to him for reasons that baffle us. Elijah is terrified by this letter and he takes off running and he hides. Now, I need to jump ahead in the story because I'm not just telling you the story of Elijah. I'm also telling you the story of Ahab and Jezebel. I'm telling you the long story that none of the stories make sense if you just look at the middle part. You have to see the whole thing to understand what's, what God's doing because God's calendar is not our calendar. So Elijah takes off and I'm going to skip parts of the story because I want to get up to where Israel now, under King Ahab, is at war with Syria. The Syrian army is told to kill the king. They're told, look for the head man. But Ahab is clever and he doesn't wear his kingly robes into battle. He goes in battle, into the battle. He's in his chariot. He's overseeing things, but he's dressed normally. He would have had on normal kind of armor. So in those days, they wouldn't have worn um, suits of metal armor. They would have worn leather protection, strips of leather sewn together. And in the seams, that would have been the weak part, the joints in the leather seams. Well, Ahab's out there, and they're look the, the Syrians are looking for the king. They can't find him. One of the Syrian soldiers puts his arrow 
onto the bowstring, pulls it back, and without even aiming, just lets it fly, wing, lets it shoot up in the air. And in one of those crazy coincidences of life, that arrow goes up in the air, and it just kind of crazily comes down, lazily wandering its way down until it strikes right in the seam of the armor of King Ahab plunging deep into his body. I've been hit, he says to the chariot driver. The chariot driver wheels around, starts away, and he says, wait, I want to see how the battle unfolds. So they get to the rear, to the back of the battle lines, turn the chariot around, and Ahab watches as the battle continues. But as the afternoon wanes, and as his blood, arterial bleeding, spurts onto the floor of the chariot, he sinks lower and lower, and finally he dies. Ahab is dead. They take him back to the palace. They bury him. One of his sons becomes king. He doesn't last too long. Another son, another son. Finally, Joram is king. Of course, Jezebel's still alive, and now one of his sons, Joram, is king. Joram, I mean, is just as bad as daddy was. So God raises up a man named Jehu. The only thing we really know about Jehu is that he was a crazy driver. You've probably heard the expression, he drives like Jehu. Maybe not, but anyway, he did. Bible says it. So he drove crazy, and Jehu is intent on wiping out the house of Ahab because they have been so bad. So he comes after Joram, catches up to Joram, shoots him in the back with an arrow. Joram dies. Jehu says to his men, here, throw him over there in that, that field, that thing. It looks like it used to be a vineyard. Yeah, that vineyard, the one that Jezebel had gotten for King Ahab at the cost of Naboth's life. And now their son, Joram, his body is tossed into that field. And now Jehu comes after Jezebel. He gets to the palace. She's inside. She has known he is coming. She has brushed her hair. She has put on makeup on her eyes. She wants to look pretty in death. And now she's leaning out the second story window. Here comes Jehu. He's riding, horse. He's riding a horse with his men. They get up there to the palace gates. And she says to him, Ah, have you come for me, Zimri? Well, Zimri, that's a historical allusion. Zimri was a king who had only been king for seven days, and then he burned the palace down around him. So she's making fun of him, calling him Zimri, belittling him. He doesn't pay any attention to it. Instead, he calls out into the palace, and he said, Is anyone in there with me? There's a flurry of activity inside the palace. And two people inside the palace grab Jezebel from behind and toss her out the window. Splat. She hits the ground below. And you know, usually you don't die from a fall from a second story window. So Jehu and his men make sure that they trample her to death. Soiling their horses' hooves with her blood. Then Jehu and his men go into the palace. They eat dinner. After they've eaten, he's in a good mood. And he says, you know what? We really should bury that woman. After all, she was a princess. You, you, and you, you go out, bury the woman. So they go out. They come back a little while later. And they said, uh, boss, sorry, uh, there wasn't enough of her to bury. Uh, the dogs got to her. The dogs got to her and all we could find was her skull, her hands, and her feet. So there was no burial for Jezebel. There was no monument to Jezebel. There was no place for people to come and say, ah, here is where Jezebel lies. No memory of her. But you know, now that I think about it, it's interesting, isn't it? That Elijah 
didn't have a burial place either. You remember? Elijah never died. He was just walking along the road with his protege, Elisha. And some kind of wormhole or something opens up in the sky and from another place comes this horses and chariot on fire. At least that's the only language the eyewitnesses could find to describe it. A flaming chariot drawn by, by flaming horses. That's what it looked like to them. And it swooped down out of the sky, came up alongside Elijah. Elijah simply stepped off planet Earth, stepped onto this chariot of fire, and whoosh, he was gone. He didn't die. He didn't have a tomb or a burial. That's where we get the song, you know. Swing low, sweet chariot, coming for to carry me home. It's from that story. That chariot swung low and picked up Elijah and took him off. Unlike the death of Ahab and Jezebel. Once powerful, they had their moment. But the moment was just a moment. And you know, if you pay, a, pay good attention to the story, you'll notice that Elijah appears later in the story. Yeah. In fact, not very far from that place where the chariot picked him up, somewhere between where the chariot picked him up and where Mount Carmel is, he appears later in this story along with Moses, the one who was no more. They don't know where he was buried either. He appears, Elijah appears with Moses and with Jesus, the creator of all things, the redeemer of all things. The three of them together on a hilltop not far from there. They're together on what we call the Mount of Transfiguration. And they're talking about Jesus. What he's going to do in Jerusalem. And then his return to heaven. It's a great long story, isn't it? And, and you and I are somewhere there in the middle of God's story.